coming. It's great to see you, and welcome to the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, I'd really like to thank you all for attending this program on technology and the city, uh, democracy, equity, and engagement. And, um, you know, we over the past year have done a number of things at SEPA to more fully engage the intersection of technology and public policy. Uh, we've introduced new classes around data and many other uh, subjects. Uh, we see the moment we're in around data and uh, technology as one that is uh, stimulating entrepreneurship amongst our students that is creating opportunities for deep research in areas around internet governance and cybersecurity, and that requires the introduction of new courses and training uh, that will equip our students to be uh, thinkers, to be entrepreneurs, and to be very deeply engaged around the innovation that's occurring in our society. So as one step in this process, as the interdisciplinary hub of public policy research and engagement at Columbia, we initiated the Dean's Challenge Grant, uh, which is inviting our students across the university and including SEPA students to come up with ideas that combine data ICT and urban problem solving. And what you'll be hearing first is from our teams. And what this reflects is really a year-long effort. Uh, and this is the culmination uh, of that effort. Um, I'm very gratified that we had very strong student response to this first effort by uh, SEPA to launch a challenge grant. And, um, and tonight, the winning teams will each receive uh, $25,000 to pursue their projects, but most importantly, They've been part of a year-long effort um, uh, to be entrepreneurs, to think about problem solving in the urban context uh, that combines technology uh, and data. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, we'll have a wonderful chance to hear from our uh, guest this evening, Minerva Tantico, who's New York's first chief technology officer, Nick Beim, a leading tech investor and partner at Venrock and Ted Bailey, the founder and CEO of a data analytics uh, company, Data Miner, which I'm told is soon about to be one of the most exciting IPOs uh, on the <laughs> market. Um, but before we do that, uh, we will first announce our winning teams for round one. And let me just say we started with 20 submissions. Um, a panel of faculty and technology entrepreneurs assessed these projects and made tough decisions. Uh, th we then had nine semi-finalists who were asked to develop uh, proposals or business models and prototypes over the ensuing five months. They worked over the course of the summer. The judges then selected five finalists who were asked to refine their proposals still further in their business models and tonight, you will be hearing from two of the teams that were selected as winners. But I should say this has been a very competitive process all year long. The judges have had a very tough time making uh, the selection. And uh, we have great <coughs> finalists here, but we have very worthy projects uh, that have been developed along the way. And the finalist teams have each uh, developed some posters which are around the room, and I invite you to visit them uh, later uh, in the evening. And I also want to take this moment to thank uh, all of the faculty and the administrators and the outside experts that have been part of this process. This took a tremendous amount of effort by many people, um, and it really has been um, uh, a fantastic example of collaboration around a new endeavor, both at SEPA and with help from Columbia Entrepreneurship and other parts of the university. So I want to thank you. We have many of the uh, people who are part of the uh, boot camp training for our teams with us tonight, and I extend my appreciation to you, uh, to uh, the faculty and the administrators of SEPA who were so deeply involved. 
And with that, I'm pleased to announce the first of these teams. Please join me in congratulating the team that created Pezaback, a program that uses mobile technology to strengthen urban healthcare policy initiatives. The Pezaback team was led by Swami Ganasan, Greg Levin, and Ritu Rajan. I'd like to welcome you to the stage to briefly uh, tell us about your project. Good evening, everyone. I'm Swami Ganesan. Maybe I'll speak in the mic. Um, I'm a, a 2014 graduate, an MPADP, uh, focusing on international development. I uh, used to be an engineer prior to that, developing mobile hardware and software. Um, so uh, I'll take five minutes to explain about what uh, uh, PaisaBack is. It's a, a mobile initiative to drive health-seeking behavior, preventive care-seeking behavior among women in India. 75% uh, of women in India are anemic, uh, of varying degrees. Um, one in four deaths of uh, cervical cancer in the world is a woman in India. Um, the, the focus primarily uh, of, of what causes this uh, has been on the supply side, lack of doctors, lack of uh, um, hospitals and uh, health staff, which is true, which continues to be true. Uh, but we had, a we had a theory that uh, the lack of demand for a, a preventive uh, health care also contributes to the situation. And we substantiated this claim uh, by conducting a short pilot in the uh, state of Madhya Pradesh. Over 83% of women, of 270 women who participated in our survey, and then eventually went on to uh, uh, be in our, in our focus group, uh, in, in our pilot, said that they went to a doctor if they were sick. And this is not only in that region. You, uh, women come in contact with the healthcare in India, in all the regions, um, primarily through pregnancy or some uh, form of childbirth-related uh, uh, incidents. And there is significant lack of awareness. Um, among 18 to 25 year olds in our, uh, in our uh, data, uh, over 65% person did not know what primary care entails. And uh, cultural barriers are real. Um, Rani here was one of our participants. Um, a mother of two living in three generations of family cannot go out and seek preventive care unless she is actually in pain of some sort. Um, technology is ubiquitous but significantly under, underutilized. There is no uh, data channel for preventive or otherwise that reaches a woman uh, who uh, about 75% in the region that we work um, have uh, direct, uh, their own personal mobile phones. So um, the model is to incentivize the women to come into the system to seek preventive care. Digital incentives that they can then exchange at a participating retail, uh, uh, retailers for goods and services. And the mobile platform helps us to retain the women in the system through active engagement. Um, if you, uh, in terms of the cycle uh, of interaction, I invite you to look at this in terms of two circles. One is the health circle and the retail circle. In the health, um, uh, she gets a reminder of her uh, preventive health care screening. She goes to the, the, the assigned center. She gets her um, customized uh, recommendation based on the screening uh, that happens, and she follows that advice and, um, and gets healthy. As a part of that visit, she earns the digital points that she's then able to exchange at the retailer. That's the retail circle, um, and then for goods and services. One of the most famous uh, uh, incentive that we were able to uh, model was uh, mobile talk time, uh, which uh, in the, uh, on an average about 250 rupees, roughly four and a half dollars a month uh, is spent by these women uh, to, uh, to sustain um, uh, their cell phones. So um, we tested the first circle, the health circle. We sent out two text messages, those are uh, in Hindi, inviting them to uh, come for the screening uh, and uh, telling them that we will offer mobile incentives. Uh, and we did another text message the next day of July, and, uh, and then that's all the promotion we did. We were able to get 75% attendance uh, from the women for, uh, for, for these two invitations with no additional promotions. And, uh, and the incentive that we offered is slightly on the higher side, about 40 cents for showing up. Uh, 30 to 40 rupees of, uh, of talk time uh, was given to them. So 
we could have achieved 82% based on our calls to the, the absentees uh, if uh, our mass messaging uh, had some problems as well as uh, scheduling. One of the villages that we picked happened to be a tier two town where women worked in offices. So our scheduling was in the morning. So many of the women, well, the other village happened to be an agricultural village. So we could have uh, attracted uh, higher uh, uh, attendance. So this uh, is uh, informing our model going forward. What we are working with is really uh, a franchise-based approach in villages. Um, and uh, so this, we want to be able to control regionally and seasonally the incentives that we give out as well as to address the local healthcare needs of that region so that a franchise approach uh, will allow us to do it and control cost, uh, which will inform us uh, how we are going to scale uh, going forward. Um, I'll just uh, skip over to the, we, we have been able to accomplish this uh, with support from SEPA as well as our ground partners. Uh, one of the key partners is, uh, is the largest NGO in, my, in, uh, in that region of state of, uh, district of Guna, where whom uh, we work with to provide operational assistance. The other one is now the model is looking more like a, a closed loop credit card system, like an uh, Amex, where we offer that card which carries uh, women's information, health information, demographic information, as well as uh, their, uh, their incentive information that our retailer is able to read and exchange the points for goods and services. Again, talk time, we are sticking with talk time for initial models. So NXP Semiconductors, who are uh, one of the leaders uh, um, in, in this digital uh, ID space, uh, is, uh, is supporting us in this initiative to, uh, to give out these cards and scale uh, in that district. Um, another, another advantage of being this, uh, mo uh, this modular uh, 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 franchise-like uh, model is we can run campaigns from Hindustan Unilever, Tata, and others to channel their products, uh, corporate products, as uh, incentives to reach the women and uh, draw them in, and keep them in the system. So we've been at it for a year and a half now uh, since the first uh, idea came about, and we're thankful for SIPA and other uh, advisors uh, around uh, CBS and SIPA who have guided us through the help as well as uh, the business aspect of uh, getting this far. There's a lot of work ahead. Uh, thank you. Congratulations. I'd like to also now announce our second winner of the Dean's Public Policy Challenge Grant, the team that developed Taranga, the peer-to-peer -peer web platform and mobile app that enables underemployed locals to become tour guides for international travelers. This team was led by Tammy Lewin and Lindsay Lit Litowitz. So please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> All right. Hi. Um, so hi, my name is Lindsay Litowitz, and this is uh, my co-founder, Tammy Lewin. So we founded Taranga after we traveled to India together um, for a social enterprise and sustainable development class um, last year. And between the two of us, we've traveled to over 50 countries. Uh, and the inspiration for the social enterprise that we're going to share with you this evening uh, came from our deep desire and belief that uh, we can combine our, tra our passion for travel and social good. So what are we solving? Um, nowadays, travelers are going farther and wider in search of adventure, exploration, and unique cultural experiences. The problem is um, they ha they're having trouble getting off the beaten path. <laughs> So they're having trouble getting off the beaten path. Hostels are making the same recommendations to everyone. Everyone's using the same guidebooks and going on the same local tours. So travelers find themselves on what's called <coughs> the Greenwood Trail, and they all end up doing having the same experiences and are left feeling uh, with a feeling of inauthenticity. 
and many of us intuitively know and feel uh, that it's the experience of the Colombian that you went salsa dancing with or the Argentine that spent the time to tell you the best place to get an empanada or the Peruvian that you met in a local market and you tasted fruits that you've never seen before. That, to many, is what really makes travel. Um, and so those are the experiences that we find enriching and fulfilling, but for many travelers, it's actually really difficult to find those, although it's really easy to find other, um, other travelers because you can recognize them by what they're wearing, um, but they're probably too shy or it's really unsafe to search for them on their own. So here's where Taranga comes in. Taranga uses mobile technology to connect what travelers want to what locals can provide. Travelers want unique cultural experiences while locals have the knowledge, skills, and interesting lives that they can share. But the best part is, is that Taranga is not just about connecting people and having amazing experiences. It's about supporting them too. Taranga believes in the power of tourism dollars. So we give travelers the opportunity to contribute to locals' dreams. So instead of going on a prepackaged tour, instead of, instead of spending your, your dollars on a prepackaged tour, you can connect with Taranga, have a better experience, and help fund their dreams. So what does our app actually look like? Oh, okay. <laughs> we forgot, Taranga also helps urban, urban hubs in developing countries <clears throat> by helping tourism dollars stay in cities. So cities in, in, in developing countries notoriously have kind of bad reputations, and, and travelers don't necessarily want to spend their time and money there. So traveler uh, Taranga capitalizes on this lost economic opportunity, and it increases the impact of tourism dollars by spreading it into the hands of everyday people. And now you're dying to know what it actually looks like. So <laughs> um, here's a mock-up of uh, Taranga. Um, so immediately when you open the app, let's say you arrive in Medellin, you're, it's uh, geolocation enabled, and so you're able to see um, other uh, locals and their profiles around you. Um, but it's really insights that lie at the heart of Taranga. So insights are not tours. There are things that people are excited and willing to share and parts of their life that um, to your friends seem normal, but to outsiders are really exciting. So it's a pickup soccer game, or it's taking you to a local market, um, or it's dinner with a, a family or a local festival. Things that travelers actually want to see when they travel, and that's why they're spending all this money to go the other side of the world. Um, so after you've shared time, uh, excuse me, after you, um, you have instantaneous chat, you can um, establish rapport very quickly. So in this case, you text Jose and you say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to go on a hike or looking to play a soccer game. Um, he sets uh, the time and the place, which is really great because we use a, um, basically a, a, a Google Maps API. And so you don't speak Spanish very well and you don't know how to get around Medellin, but um, you get a notification from Taranga, you know exactly where to go to meet Jose um, and to go on a hike. Uh, after it's done, we have a dual review system, and so you're able to um, leave a review for Jose. You can also leave a gratitude note, which you can have public or private. Essentially, a gratitude note is, um, uh, a gratitude is one of our main values in that um, you spend time together and you express your, your gratitude. Um, and then you also get the opportunity to contribute um, to Jose's dream or social cause, which he chooses. Um, so we've done a lot of research, we've evolved our model, we've talked to a lot of people, done a lot of uh, uh, interviews, had a lot of coffee. Um, and what we're presenting to you is, uh, is over a year of work. Um, and we, we really have tested our assumptions and we're really happy to present to you uh, what we've learned with Taranga. So there's actually many other um, entrepreneurs that have spotted this opportunity. Um, we've we found over 10 um, that have launched in the last several years. Um, but through all of our market research that we've done, um, we discovered why we think that they all have it wrong. So you guys are all looking at our competitor landscape. Um, I'll just come over. Um, so basically on the horizontal axis is type. Um, so everything over here, so couch surfing is accommodation, Tinder is dating, and then every, everything over here is based solely around eating with, like eating at a local's house. And then the Y axis is um, about how you pay. So basically everything below the line has the model of um, an upfront payment. So you know, a local says, it, you know, I'm going to charge this much to go on a hike. So everything in this left quad quadrant is free. And then Taranga over there um, is basically the only app that um, not only is, is solely experience um, focused, but it's focused on contributing to the person, not paying for an experience. So where are we now? Um, 
basically what right now we're uh, talking to developers and we're coding the app and so we expect to that to be our MVP to be coded and finished by May and then mid-May and then in June we'll head back to Columbia. Um, we'll test it out with our locals, our community of locals um, and then we'll grow our community from there. So we'd like to share a story from one of the locals that we met during market research this summer. So this is Natalie. Um, we met her when we were uh, interviewing her in a small coffee shop in Medellin. She's a 22-year-old student, um, very passionate about art. And as we went through um, our, our interview guide with her, um, we learned a lot about her story and her life. And so she's from a small town about four hours south of Medellin called um, Jardin. And she has a um, kind of difficult childhood. Her, her mother and her sister were kidnapped, um, which she witnessed when she was younger. And I won't go into the details, but being able to hear her story and hear how her, her art now um, was impacted by her childhood, and even though she hasn't been back to Hardeen, but as an artist and a photographer, how she's so proud to be Colombian and she's so happy to welcome travelers who are coming to Colombia um, and explain to them uh, really its complicated political history. Um, so uh, when well, we asked her, if you were on Tarango, what, what dream would you have? And she said, I've been thinking about this community art project for a very long time. And if you guys could put the app in my hand today, that's what I would put on my profile. And in exchange, I am so passionate to meet travelers and I want to show them the places in Medellin that give me inspiration for my art, um, as well as my studio. And so we actually told her um, that we were going to present her picture um, to all of you this evening. Um, and I asked her if she had anything she wanted to say in her own words. Um, and this is what she said, and it's more poetic in Spanish. Um, but she said, we are all full of stories that shape us, and these stories make us, any, make, make us more than anything else human. What makes us grow? As an artist, I believe the little things, little things help the world in some way. I think that is Taranga, and I would love to have the opportunity to meet more people with that same desire. That's why we're so passionate about this mobile app. That's why we, we're building this global community. Um, we're raising money, we're taking volunteers, and we have the mobile app, so if you wanna come and play with it after the, um, the event, we'd be more than happy to meet with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank both teams for their excellent work. We look forward to hearing of your progress. And I also want to thank all the other teams for their projects, including the finalists uh, Open uh, Government Toolkit, Shadi Karma, and Madad, who will each receive uh, $5,000 to support their continued uh, development. And please stay tuned, everyone, for the second round of the challenge grant, which is well underway. And we will be um, having our final uh, presentations um, around graduation. So with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, someone who's really responsible for addressing the full range of technology issues, challenges, and opportunities confronting New York City. As New York's first technology officer, chief technology officer, Minerva Tantico directs the mayor's office of technology and innovation, uh, which is responsible for the development and coordination of citywide strategy on technology and innovation. She has extensive experience in the tech sector. She's led emerging technology initiatives, including around artificial intelligence, e-commerce, virtualization, online marketing, mobile applications. She holds four U.S. patents. She's been a senior product manager at Palm, a chief architect, excuse me, at Bank of America, Mer Merrill Lynch. Um, she recently served as CTO for a client-facing technology and innovation effort at UBS, and um, I think probably relevant for her current position, she was raised in, in Queens and is a product of New York City. So we are very honored and pleased to have her join us this evening to talk about technology in New York City, and then we'll be followed by a, a, a discussion with Nick Beim and Ted Bailey, who I will introduce uh, after Minerva's uh, opening remarks. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, everyone. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Um, actually, I'm not totally fine. I have a sore throat, but I think I can keep it together for the next uh, little while. Um, really delighted to be here. And on behalf of uh, one of uh, your favorite alums, a mayor of New York City, de Blasio, 
we're delighted um, to be invited here to come and speak. I am just delighted all the time. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I wanted to give you just very briefly a little bit of a personal background to answer the question, you know, what's a techie doing in City Hall? Um, you know, I've been a techie for 30 years. I, I grew up in Flushing, Queens, as, as Dean Jano um, uh, noted. And I went through all public, New York City public schools, including the Bronx High School of Science. Um, I, I, when I went to college, I left school for one semester to form a startup in Silicon Valley in 1985. Yes, 1985, 30 years <laughs> ago. Um, and I've been in startup mode ever since uh, through each wave of technology transformation, personal computing, publishing, uh, web advertising, e-commerce, you know, financial services, and now government, the last <laughs> frontier of digital <laughs> transformation, right guys? Um, that's why I'm here talking to you all. So, you know, I've been in, around, you know, in the working world for about 30 years. I've been a chief technology officer for 17 years and the last 10 in financial services, you know, helping to transform that industry to be more adaptive and customer centric. And so tonight we're going to talk more, um, just, I'll just make some opening remarks around democracy, equity, and engagement. So as Chief Technology Officer, my team is tasked with making New York City the most tech-friendly and innovative city in the world. This is sort of the phrase that, that the mayor tasked me with, and I was like, yes, very tall man, I will do that. <laughs> um, you know, and the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation was created to span across the traditional silos of government and to drive a coordinated citywide strategy on tech and innovation. So the creation of the chief technology officer role, which by the way has existed at least 17 years in the private sector where I just came from, you know, it, to have that in government is actually still fairly new and it indicates um, the sort of the growing importance of technology in government, um, both in terms of how governments will deliver government services, but also in democratizing access to technology, sort of being able to harness technology as a way to democratize um, society. And, you know, in many ways, the, the almost the final symbol of the democratization of information technology itself. So I've been around for a long time, you know, in, in the old days when, you know, um, there was just a very small number of people locked in a room and they were in charge of the technology, you know. And now everyone's got it in their pockets and on their wrist watches and everything else. And this is this has a deep meaning not only for society and you know your Fitbits and everything else, but also for us as citizens, as residents of, of New York and, and citizens of the world. So the mayor set forth a bold vision for how technology can be a tool for creating a more fair, um, equitable, and smart city. So when we think about smart cities, and I'm sure a lot of you have given this some thought, I mean, tr traditional smart cities thinking about growth, how do we handle the explosive growth of cities all over the world and their importance in global trends? We talk about sustainability, how can we envision and execute plans towards a more sustainable planet, you know, one city at a time, right? Um, Resiliency, so after Hurricane Sandy and a bunch of other things, you know, how do we define the next generation of cities to withstand natural and unnatural disasters and cities that will last and adapt to change? But to these three things, they're all very important, uh, we would add the concept of equity. That a smart city is an equitable city. That another way to put it is social sustainability. Designing a city and an economy that benefits all of its residents closes the technology gap, the gender gap, the education, the in income, and innovation gaps in the city. This is the challenge that really faces us today. Um, so the approach that we are taking is to choose and prioritize all these many possible initiatives that we can do and goals that we might have along several organizing themes. So one is, of course, the efficiency, efficiency of technology to better serve New Yorkers and how we 
manage technology, the, the technology of the government itself, to do it more efficiently, buy it more cheaply, buy it more adaptively, more quickly. Um, this involves a lot of labyrinthine processes around procurement and regulations and things like that. A hairy, naughty problem that we like to call in technology. Um, but it is something that we're, we're very focused on, on figuring out ways to do that and allow more and more companies to provide that technology to the government and how do we free up that barrier to innovation in government. Engagement. So one of the topics, engaging residents themselves, and I love the, you know, some of the winners because how do we take the lessons, um, the playbooks of, you know, the things that we're, how do we make people ad addicted to healthy behavior as they are addicted to Facebook, right? How do we make people um, really want to engage in their communities in the same way they can engage online and watch, you know, videos of cats, right? Um, is that we all know. I know you all do it. I don't, of course. Um, <laughs> um, and so, and beyond that, influencing, giving people the power, engaging them in the power to be able to make hyper-local decision-making, policy-making, um, and, and, you know, part of the addictive quality is seeing the results of what you do, right? You post something, you get likes. Well, you know, what if you requested, you know, we need a, we need a pop-up government shop right here, or, you know, we'd like to see more mobile you know, mobile government in a van, you know, coming to me and, and, and letting me sign up for, you know, for um, some services. So we want to empower all New Yorkers in this new economy. So the next piece is about the tech economy. Um, we want to focus, as I said, on social sustainability and not just create a tech sector that leaves a whole set of people out. And how do we create that level playing field for everyone? And that includes, you know, computer science education for everyone, um, uh, training and jobs for everyone, and particularly the most vulnerable populations. And finally, how do we improve the lives of everyday New Yorkers? You know, that's all of us, you and me. So I want to give you uh, some examples, one example, but some, some other ones is, you know, we want to foster these creative problem solving and innovative thinking. And this is really to get your creative juices flowing because I think we're only at the very, very tip, this incredibly exciting tip of the iceberg, you know, for this next generation of how government can operate and engage. And so this is where your great minds will help create the next generation of government technology. And there's a huge opportunity for all of you. Um, how do we build public-private partnerships? Do we need something like a GovTech accelerator you know, that will help grow those technologies that meet the needs of governments today that harness those latest technologies for everyone's good? Do we use um, the power of our thriving tech sector um, to bolster and improve government services themselves? Should, should uh, you know, should you be able to get um, health information, you know, tweetable, right? That kind of stuff. Um, and ensuring that innovative ideas that surface can actually be put into action. This is sort of the notion of what happens after the hackathon, right? <laughs> How do we actually make those great ideas real? So very, very quickly, um, I'll give you one example which you know you might already be familiar with, but a little bit of the inside baseball for you policy wonks, right, uh, is Link NYC. This is New York City's plan to build the largest and fastest municipal Wi-Fi network in the world, um, with speeds starting at 100 megabits, some going uh, experimental ones going to uh, a gigabit. Yes, that's 1,000 megabytes for those of you non-techies out there. It was an effort that started with a public competition. So again, it or originally originated in the last administration was saying, what should we do with these old, nasty pay phones? Been, you know, it's so interesting because you don't, you couldn't foresee that when they gave that franchise, you know, they awarded that franchise 15, 20 years ago that we would be looking at them like, why do we need these anymore, right? They probably thought, woohoo, we got these, this franchise, we're gonna have these great pay phones, all you have to do is put a quarter in them and you can make a phone call. And a short, you know, 15 years later, it was ridiculous, a ridiculous idea. And I think we need to understand that the pace of change is such that you can't assume anything anymore. 
which goes uh, directly counter to the planning horizons for a city, right, which are very long, decades long. So I think we're going to have to cope with this tension somehow. Um, we then awarded this, but the RFP process was also fascinating because instead of saying, here's the things we need, give us your lowest bid, we said, we'd like these payphones to become Wi-Fi hotspots, so give us your best solution and we'll pick the best solution. So that sort of flipped it on its head. The other thing that flipped uh, we did was um, it's a franchise, so in fact it didn't cost the taxpayers any money that instead it's a revenue share with the franchise awardee. So the city gets 50% of the revenue that they get from the digital advertising on those, and there's no cost to the taxpayers for this. So this model is perhaps a new way to look at it. And finally, I'll just close because I'm taking too long. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we see this as just the beginning because once you have the um, – Wi-Fi hotspots, once you have sort of uh, more ubiquitous ac ac um, access to the internet, you can actually then, uh, this is very important to have the infrastructure out there and have free and accessible broadband for everybody. But the thing that I think is really um, important is how do you then use that technology? So yes, yeah, so now instead of saying, you know, here everybody have internet access, we're done. It's kind of like, actually, no, that's just the beginning. How can we use this to say, you know what? We can ask the people on this street corner what they think should be here or what they think of that construction site or um, get information or tourists can find out exactly where they need to go or they could use, you know, Taranga to find, you know, a, um, a local who will show them, you know, the, the secret entrance behind, you know, Grand Central or what have you. And so that infrastructure is just the first piece of the even more important piece of then how do we, once we've got access in more places and people um, who can use that technology, how do we use that then to engage uh, New Yorkers in, and get involved in their communities um, better? So I think, um, and also to harness this technology again back to helping the most vulnerable, right? So. Um, I think there's a lot of good trends uh, happening now with the opening of, you know, uh, things like Civic Hall, um, which recently opened, um, is that ability to sort of grow this kind of gov tech sector and create those those cauldrons of collaboration um, in many different sectors in many different ways, so that we actually put industry next to government, next to education, next to you know, the people who, who need the technology to the, 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 the girl on the street um, who, who wants to pursue a career in science and put all that together and create those opportunities so we can, um, we can, we can indeed make New York the most innovative and tech-friendly city in the world. So with that, I think I will um, defer to my esteemed uh, co-panelists and we can continue the discussion. Thanks very much. Well, I'm very delighted to have Nick Beim and Ted Bailey with us today. Uh, Nick is a partner, leading technology investor and partner at Benrock, uh, one of the great and early venture capital firms uh, in the United States. Uh, he really has, in his career, uh, invested and been a pioneering investor in a number of consumer uh, internet companies such as the Gilt Group, uh, Care.com, as well as Data Miner, Intent Media, and several others. Prior to uh, joining Benrock, he was a partner at Matrix Partners and uh, also was at McKinsey. He's been very involved with Endeavor globally and um, uh, uh, I know has written uh, quite a bit also about how New York uh, can be supportive of the tech community, the tech sector. Uh, Really excited to have you here, Ted. I know that you're in a pre-IPO uh, uh, life experience right now, and that's a very intense one. 
Um, he is chief executive officer, founder, and chairman of Dataminer, which he founded in 2009 as the first technology company to build a bridge between the emerging real-time front edge of Twitter and the unique needs of the business professional. That's a direct quote, and I'm hoping <laughs> that you will explain to us what that means. <coughs> but the Wall Street Journal has already described you as a business model that suggests almost infinite possibilities. With a BA from Yale in American studies and a concentration on technology's impact on society, I think that um, uh, your background, and, and indeed uh, Nick's as well, really has been combining social sciences with data and technology in very innovative ways. So I'm hoping that you can bring that into our conversation uh, today. And I just want to thank you both for being with us. And invite you, perhaps, Nick, to start us off by sharing your thoughts and reaction to Minerva's comments about New York City. Uh, sure. I, I am delighted that Minerva is part of the New York City government. I think people like Minerva are desperately needed in governments, um, local, state, national. I was t chatting with Minerva earlier. One of my good friends, DJ Patil, has just become the first chief data scientist of the U.S. The, the moment in time today uh, in technology I would describe as one of extreme empowerment. And I, I, I don't mean that hyperbolically. The cost of most technology tools is asymptotically approaching zero. The cost to try new ideas uh, has, as its primary gating factor, good ideas. I, really, it is, it is a moment for governments, for nonprofits, um, policy organizations. Council on Foreign Relations has been terrific in its uh, activities using technology. Um, very interesting uh, nonprofit work like Khan Academy, and of course, the explosion of startups that are seizing this moment, these very inexpensive, very rich technology tools. And um, interestingly, many of the movers and shakers in this world come from social sciences background. Ted and I as examples, the entrepreneurs I invested in in the Guild Group, in Care.com, in Ted Media, it, you don't have to be a techie to power tech innovation today. What you need is really big ideas. And um, I would just encourage those here, I, I love the uh, presentation of the winners of the contest, Drung and, and um, Pace it back. back, right? Yes. Uh, as great examples, inexpensive, very impactful. Um, and I think this broad trend of empowerment is just starting. So I think many of the people in this room are very well positioned to make a difference, whether it's in government, nonprofits, or the private sector. Thank you. Ted, tell us a little bit about what you've done and how you think, if you will, uh, you know, the, the capacity is there to be of value in, in urban policy or in cities or in the policy context. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you uh, for having me. It's a wonderful event, and you know, I, I, uh, I think it's amazing what you're doing uh, with the city. Um, you know, essentially, what the company that uh, I'm CEO of does, in a nutshell, and I, I won't spend much time on this, um, is we detect information out there across the data landscape, primarily from Twitter. Um, programmatically <coughs> ascertain if it's relevant and actionable and then provide those signals to clients that range from financial services um, to the news sector where we have about 150 newsrooms as clients to um, risk and security groups and also governments um, and both local and federal government entities. Um, and um, I think there's two things I'd point out which is Essentially, Data Miner is a company that focuses on humans being a sensor um, and then being able to provide the, uh, you know, what they're seeing and, and feeling uh, via Twitter out there to a company like ours that can register that, uh, develop algorithms, and ultimately create signals that are interesting. And one of the most interesting attributes of a city is um, <coughs> where there are the most human sensors. Um, and, and where actually the signals that one can detect that are human generated are um, you know, most actionable in the sense that they're, they're, they're able to be detected earliest and with the greatest statistical accuracy just because of the sheer volume of tweets and other data like that, but also because of just the uh, physical proximity of all those types of individuals. So cities are these unbelievably data-rich environments um, so, you know, my hope as an entrepreneur is, you know, uh, uh, that ultimately 
what we do on top of uh, data that cities and other urban environments have a lot to do with creating actually ends up helping a city on, on the tail end. And we actually do have um, programs started with some major cities uh, for emergency response and security. And ultimately, what we found is that some of the signals that we surface are often in advance of 911 calls and other types of information that cities have had in the past coming from the public just because when people see or hear things that might be problematic, they sometimes tweet as their first activity. Um, so I think you know what we do is very oriented around a city, and we have cities as clients. Um, so you know I, I think uh, definitely the the New York startup scene has been kind to us, um, and you know hopefully I can not I can take advantage of two of your silos, right? So be a, in the startup scene, but also help the city. Um, so you know that's our goal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Nick. What could we? What do you think are the policy measures that could be taken to help the tech sector? What should Minerva be championing in, uh, in her job as CTO uh, to support the tech sector? It's a good question. I would say the, um, the, the good news as a sort of basic baseline to answer the question is the tech sector in New York is thriving. It is growing immensely rapidly. Um, I've actually spent a ton of time trying to measure exactly how big it is. It is roughly 30% the size of Silicon Valley. And 10 years ago, when I started investing in New York, it was an unconventional idea. <laughs> there were not a lot, there was DoubleClick. Um, there were a few other companies of some scale, but so the tech sector, I think you've got a great, as, as Minerva knows, there's a great basis to start with. I think the thought that Minerva introduced of governments having proactive CTOs who are not just making the technology trains run on time, sort of CIO job, or internal VP of engineering job in a tech company, but people whose job it is to think what great new technologies can help us be better at what we do, offer new services, lower cost of access to these services for disadvantaged groups. I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think governments have generally not done it. I think New York is really pioneering in this regard. And I think the White House is trying to be pioneering Megan Smith, uh, Todd Park, DJ, and others. Um, so I think the first thing is to take a very proactive outreach stance to what, how can we work together with the community? What new technologies can we use in the city? Procurement is obviously a part of that. I loved your mm -hmm. comment on solutions. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, you had to be a 80,000 person company to just qualify for a contract with most governments, <laughs> and startups would be far too risky, and um, so many great technologies were this. I think the, um, there's some other very important long-term trends that government, could, or uh, solutions that government can be a part of. The, the biggest scarcity we have in New York um, is it's, it's not great people, it's not even great ideas, it's great engineers. We, Silicon Valley was created around Stanford. We have Columbia, NYU, some great uh, technology schools. Not quite the scale of a Stanford or MIT, which helped start Route 128 in Boston. I think with Cornell Technion, that's starting to change. <coughs> um, but ways to, I think the shortcut to getting great engineers in New York is to have big companies Make it easier with whatever incentives governments can offer for companies like Google, eBay, Amazon, and others to come to New York. Landing Google in New York in a big way was electric for the startup ecosystem. Those engineers created new companies, created partnerships, bought local companies. So I think bringing more engineering heavy companies to New York will be helpful. Um, and just engaging with the community. The community loves the idea of working with government. and. Until recently, we didn't know who to talk to. So I, we now, we now we know you're going to have a lot of <laughs> emails coming. I'm sure. <laughs> so let me ask Minerva, where are you finding the most receptivity to change within city government or city services? You know, it's um, first of all, uh, I think most definitely, it's a very special time because we have a relatively new. Uh, administration, the freshman year has just ended, you know, we're entering our sophomore year, as it were. And, you know, there's a kind of new and fresh look at everything. So I think it was it was a great time to join uh, government in this in this mode. Um, and I think the receptivity is is everywhere. I, I know it's gonna sound really crazy, but um, I, I expected far more um, sort of entrenchment and resistance, and in fact, I'm getting folks telling me, "You need to think bigger. You know, <laughs> um, don't don't be shy. Come come back with your wackiest, you know, 
idea and, and, and sort of that, that optimism that technologists have that science fiction is reality, um, <laughs> that it will someday come true. And I think, you know, to, um, to your point about uh, talent, I just wanted to go back to that very briefly because it is a big focus. We, we have a new, uh, we have a, a, a new initiative in this administration, the Tech Talent Pipeline. It's run by the former executive director of Girls Who Code, Kristen Titus. And its only function is to grow the tech talent pipeline for New York City. It is 100% essential to continuing the growth of New York's tech uh, sector to make sure that we, we have the talent here. Um, and so in sort of the mode of turning adversity into advantage, we're also making sure that it is the most diverse sort of tech talent pipeline. Um, because we feel diversity is also an incredible, important com competitive advantage. So as we have more millennials, more women, more you know, uh, elderly, well, you need those folks in your tech team to really understand and help design those products for those audiences. So you know, we're, we're taking the fact that you know, Queens is the most diverse place on the planet and see that as a huge advantage and an opportunity for us to grow that talent locally. Um, as well as encouraging um, engineers from all over the country and all over the world to come and make their career here in tech. Thank you very much. I'm going to open this up for questions, so please uh, join me in one second. But I want to ask Ted a really hard question, if uh -oh. you don't mind. Uh, and that is uh, the following. You know, we have been asking ourselves uh, here the question of what kind of problems uh, policy problems, uh, city problems, if you had the data, you could really make a big difference in solving. How would you start thinking about the problem? You don't need to answer the question about the answers, but just how would you think about that problem? <coughs> that is a tough question. <laughs> um, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I think, you know, from, from the vantage point, I, I have a few different lenses. I mean, one, I'm at a company in the city that is looking to be as well supported as possible. The second it is, you know, uh, we do business with cities. So there's the second attribute is, you know, I, I've had that experience as well. I think, I think on the second side, one of the barriers that's been challenging for us to get into work with the government has been that, you know, when we were a five to 10 person company off the radar, you know, it's challenging even, even though um, you know, we saw a need for what we did, <coughs> and even when we got our first opportunity to present to some people in New York City, they saw the value um, of what we did. That, that, that meant we were maybe two to three years away <laughs> from uh, our first contract. Um, I mean, I'm being somewhat sarcastic, but um, you know, getting into uh, doing business with cities and governments is, is a big hurdle. Um, and I think that, you know, what you said just completely resonated with me because there's so much innovation that, you know, probably dies in the vine in terms of just not able to get over the hump of even, it's not that they don't talk to people at the city, it's that ultimately it just, it just takes a lot to get through that process. So opening that up and making that a more active dialogue with ways to, you know, get starter programs that are small for younger companies that you know can actually have a contract with a government entity even if it's tiny and in some kind of innovative way I actually think will make the venture community want to back more companies going into the startup space because I think a lot of people that have the option sometimes steer away from innovating in the government space because of those barriers because there's this thought that it's going to take so much upfront resources and you're not going to get over it so I mean I think it's very important from a policy perspective to actually have means and you know sort of procurement um, policy that fosters you know ways into working with cities more, and I think it could have a dramatic impact. Um, so you know something that I've lived and, and, and felt, and you know so basically you just need a policy of you know sign a government contract in a week, you know, it's very clear. Okay. I'm giving you the policy, it's very sure. simple. Okay. Um, Thank you. Let me write that down. Yeah. <laughs> simple policy. Okay, um, form a company in a day and get a government contract in a week. There's the new motto. Let me invite any questions. We have a lot of expertise in the room. Please. 
technology, government, public policy, unfortunately it seems like the public, the public opinion of government is relatively low, if not at an all-time low, and probably not just in the US. So I've always wondered, could we go back to the original concept of Grecian democracy, direct democracy, where it's basically we cut out you know, the representative layer and people vote directly on public policy? Uh-huh. There's something in that, and participatory budgeting has an element of that. I might throw out a few quick thoughts on that, just because I, I study Grecian democracy. <laughs> <laughs> I care a lot about this. And, um, I would say uh, a couple of things. One is social media is collapsing that gap pretty rapidly. Not, and it never will all the way. And actually, I think we don't have to debate the virtues of deliberation amongst representatives and how corrupted it can be by interest groups and other things. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I would say there's a direct connection between government people with social media that is startlingly, that, that acts startlingly quickly. Whereas if there's a very, and I think uh, net neutrality is a great example where there were a lot of people, and I know I was one, I think Ted was one, who had a point of view that this is what we should do on net neutrality. And I didn't set up a, an appointment with my congressman to tell him about it, because I it would have taken a year. And I hope he would have listened to me, and, but I don't know. Um, and cable companies are very strong in New York. And, but a lot of people expressed their views over the internet. There were articles, there were memes, the John Oliver show, I mean, all sorts of great ways of expressing a, a point of view, and it's a complex issue, and certainly social media has its faults of so oversimplifying things and having sort of flash mobs that get angry, but uh, I think that played an enormous role in, in public policy. So um, that has opened up the communication channels to the public, and I think it's pretty interesting. When it comes to voting, um, you know, it's the governments and parties have been very slow to adopt electronic voting. Um, I mean, I think California is the most interesting experiment in direct democracy, and there's been some great and some fairly wacky like results from that. Um, but it hasn't really been technology enabled. It's more petition enabled, old fashioned metrics. But I think social media is the most interesting trend on that. Thank you. Uh, let me coll any other collect another question? Yes. Let me collect uh, one or two other questions and then let our panel ask in the back. David? Yeah, I was wondering, there was some mention of closing, using technology to close the inequality gap in society. How do you do that? How do you use technology to close it? How do people close the inequality gap? Mm -hmm. Sir? Hi, my name is Deji from Access. Um, some of this has been really great to hear. Each of them seems to have uh, privacy implications from sort of open Wi-Fi uh, to data, data miner um, at uh, Ted's company. I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that and how you incorporate it into your policies moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Why don't we start here and let Minerva have the last word. Um, so I will defer on these two on privacy, but okay. I, there's one, one I, the, the inequality question is a great one. And I know Minerva's been working hard at this in the, in the context of the city. She'll know a lot more than I will. But the um, two things that I would say that make me very hopeful on that point, although there's a lot of work to be done. One is the cost of basic access technologies is just dropping unbelievably rapidly. So the amount of money it takes to enable people to participate in online education, in social media, have access to the political learning that the rest of us went from on the internet is getting lower and lower. And, and from not just access technology, but many other technologies um, are getting cheaper and cheaper and easier and easier to use. And I think that expands the envelope of who can benefit from them. I think the most interesting example at a high level in my mind is not, and maybe just because I don't know a fraction as much as whatever does about New York City, but internationally, if you look at the impact that technologies had in emerging market countries and lifting them rapidly, 
not just to basic service levels, but often beyond the sophistication levels of advanced countries, mobile banking in Africa is the most advanced in the world. It's stunning. You, you can live your life on a flip phone. And you can have a bank account, you can pay, you can receive money. Um, and it was all done with very cheap infrastructure. Um, I am most excited about the explosion in online learning um, and how that benefits the world. I mean, it'll benefit New York City, but it'll benefit the world in, in measure. The cost of great education has gone to zero. And, it's, and certainly there, SIPA, other great organizations are needed and the, the personal connections and the great tutoring and so on is very important. But access to the basic, uh, to basic knowledge and basic learning techniques is available across Africa, Southeast Asia, places it wasn't previously. I think it'll have an electric effect. And there's obviously more to be done. We're not all the way there, but it makes me very hopeful. Thank you. <coughs> well, I mean, I... I um, You're going to have to get used to this privacy question, by I've, the way. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the privacy question is, is certainly one that, um, you know, I, I am immersed in. I think I what, what makes what we do e easy on that front is that um, the data sets that we currently, and I say currently because, you know, we'll be expanding over time, focus primarily on, namely, Twitter, are unique in that the intention of the person publishing is to broadcast the information broadly, and it's an open environment. Um, and actually, legally, the act of tweeting is making public, even definitionally, if you look on, you know, bodies like the SEC, that's the act of public disclosure. Um, so from our perspective, Privacy is actually not as much of a, of, a, of a core issue with the type of service that we currently provide, but there are so many other data sets which are in a hazier gray in the middle where you know, the intention of the individual is not to get the data out there and seen uh, uh, loud and clear. And I think you know, there's definitely always pros and cons to interpreting on either side of that spectrum with saving lives versus you know, respecting privacy. And I think it's a very complex issue for a city, definitely because of the sheer magnitude of data sets they have about aggregate activity and human activity and how those can be smartly used to better protect the individuals. And balancing that with the desire to not be invasive is a challenge. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, you know, at, at our company, we focus on, on currently on very, very, uh, in, you know, broad public data sets, but over time we'll be incorporating more and more, and it's something I think a lot about in terms of where the right line is, so. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, you know, you bring up a very, very important point, and so I'll just say uh, two quick things. One, when we were developing the agreement for Link NYC, because we, we wanted the, um, our first <coughs> municipal Wi-Fi to also be encrypted, so many public Wi-Fi is not encrypted at all. So we wanted to make sure it was encrypted. Um, and Hotspot 2.0 was sort of the latest version of this. And that required you know, the users to create a, a, an ID and password, which you know, in many cases is considered private information. So we actually wrote a privacy policy to go with the link NYC hotspots. That essentially went on a, a level of principles, the idea that you, the individual, own your information. Um, we made it part of the agreement that if you were to create an account to use our links, that your information would never be sold to a third party. That was a condition of granting the franchise. And that only if you opted in would you allow, you know, if you wanted to receive a coupon for the local sandwich shop, then you had the right to do that. But that either the franchise or the city of New York don't own your data at any time, that you give up to use it. So this was a very strongly worded, stronger than most. We, we looked at the, you know, the standards in Europe. We looked at the standards across other municipal Wi-Fis. And, and we were told by various um, you know, uh, privacy bodies that this was some of the strongest privacy policy language that they'd seen in a while. Because we wanted to make sure that if people were going to walk up and use you know, these links, that they felt that we had your privacy at heart. And if you wanted to give, a, give it away, that was up to you. Um, the second piece is that this is not you know, a simple, 
you know, answer. I mean, we have to balance this, for example, especially with our, you know, open data sets, right? At some point, we, we want to we wanna provide and publish a lot of the open data that's available. But some, some information is sensitive, and we don't want, you know, um, folks to be able to backwards uh, calculate who actually complained about my party that night, right? And figure out by tracing backwards, you know, which neighbor sort of reported that crack house, right? You don't want that information. So it's a fine balance, right? Because you do want to publish as much information as possible, um, but you also want to protect the victims and protect the people that are calling 911, for example. So, so you know, it's a very fine balance, incredibly complex issue in the, between openness and privacy. Um, and you know, we'll continue to at least do our best to, to put the interests of New Yorkers you know, at, at the front. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful discussion. Please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Well, you have a good job. <laughs>